Good evening, everybody. I'm Matt Mackey, five-star home inspection uh, based out of College Park. Uh, tonight, this is not a talk about asbestos. This is a talk about judgment about asbestos. Um, Sean asked me to make a presentation tonight, but as a newbie in a room full of people who have decades of experience ahead of me, I uh, wondered what on earth I could possibly talk about. Asbestos seemed to be one hot button issue where I had something to add. Uh, in a previous career, uh, I worked in a um, uh, building material reuse resale. I ran into a lot of asbestos. Um, but the ASHI training course is kind of skimpy when they cover it. We're not required to point it out. So they didn't talk a lot about it. We had an air quality specialist here a few months ago and I could hear the online questions blowing up. What about textured ceilings? What about this? What about that? There was a real shortage of information out there. Um, so I figured tonight I could come out and help people um, figure out maybe where to point the asbestos finger. Um, I should, not asbestos. I should say I brought some show and tell. It's all bagged up, wrapped up. Um, if anybody has any concerns about the dust off of it, I'm happy to take it right outside, set it outside. But everything is airtight. Um, so uh, another problem with the ASHI training, a lot of the pictures they showed you are zoomed in, out of focus, without context. You're not sure what you're looking at, how large it is. Um, for the new guys like me going into the field, you know, I grew up with some of this stuff, so some of it I recognize, but there's a big experience gap for younger people and newer people. And I was hoping to fill some of that tonight. Um, your business decision may be to make a blanket statement about possible asbestos in homes of a certain age. Um, there we go. The, uh, and, and to leave the suspicion and testing up to the client, you may provide some guidance where it's likely worth their effort to investigate, but throwing shade on houses of a certain age isn't very helpful by itself. No client will ever be able to puzzle out which surfaces and how to, how to, um, get tested for asbestos. There's, it's not real, really well advertised. And we're the ones with the most building materials experience in a real estate transaction. Uh, so tonight I'd like to take a deeper dive into what should be setting off our spidey sense when we inspect a home to get a clearer focus on which items we might choose to warn our client about. Which brings us to the poster child for asbestos, nine inch floor tile. Uh, in my previous career at the nonprofit, uh, one of my jobs was to sell all the tile that was donated to us. I would get boxes of unused vintage tile, <coughs> pardon me, surplus leftovers left by the tile setters to molder in basements and garages for years. They would get donated to us and the boxes themselves were super handy. It'll tell you right there asbestos. And I brought some samples in if anybody wants to uh, pick through. Um, helpful people on the internet told me that all nine inch tile was asbestos and that all 12 inch tile was not asbestos. But when I started looking at the boxes, I found some nine inch tiles that didn't claim asbestos content and I found some 12 inch tile that did. Solid vinyl, nine inch and 12 inch. Vinyl asbestos, nine inch and 12 inch, indistinguishable. Um, we'll take the manufacturer at their word, right? And it was, um, asbestos was great to advertise on the box right up to the moment it wasn't. Um, fire was a really big deal. But even before the age of Sputnik, we were heavily sold on the idea that industrial innovation would save the world. The thing is, they didn't stop adding asbestos the night they turned off the nine inch machines, plugged in the 12 inch machines, turned on the lights and the modern age began. Those sizes overlapped for decades. Um, to test my suspicion, I tracked down old tile catalogs on eBay and apologies for how close we are to dinner time here. <laughs> I got this. It's the asbestos version of when Dorothy and Toto 
step out of the house onto the yellow brick road, right into Technicolor. Um, asbestos floor tile came in 9, 12, 18, 24 inch medallions, planks, all of it. And so did pure vinyl, rubber, rubberoid, and asphalt. Hence the mantra, test, test, test. You can't tell by looking at it. You really don't even have a good idea because we don't know how much of nine inch tile was asbestos and how much wasn't. Um, the 12 inch tiles uh, labeled as asbestos bearing uh, might be peel and stick. They might look 70s and schlocky or they might be like this one, a dead ringer for a modern VCT that you would see in any grocery store. Um, these days they even make nine inch retro tile and I've got one here, tested, no asbestos. Um, and you, you really never know when the, the tile floor was laid. Might appear original to the house, might not be. It's an inexact science to puzzle out, puzzle out from details the appearance of it when it was laid. So you've got to test, test, test. Um, I've got here nine inch tile, asbestos. Nine inch tile, not asbestos. This is, um, I'll get to the lab testing in a little bit. More nine inch tile, not asbestos. And 12 inch tile from a neighbor's house, asbestos. You can't tell by looking at it, they're all, all the same. Um, so you've got to test. Uh, air cell, in, air cell. The pipe insulation is a little more straightforward. Um, that's it. This is from the house I grew up in. It's still there. Um, in fact, I cut off a piece that was hanging above where my dad's um, lake was on his train setup. Um, it's got asbestos paper, layers of corrugated and straight asbestos paper sandwiched together, wrapped with canvas or painted sealed shut. Um, and I'll leave that out. Uh, it feels greasy when you touch it, it's slippery. Um, similar material came in big flat sheets. This is my dad's old 1935 oil burner. The whole thing is lined with sheets of this stuff that are peeling off. Um, nobody goes down there. Um, this stuff is very friable. The practical definition of friability is the ease of crushing it with your hand and releasing dust and fibers into the air. Yes, Bob. Um, whenever I see oil burners, um, I'll often see a sheet of asbestos next to it to protect it from, or the, protect the framing from the oil burner, or <clears throat> especially when it's a, a short ceiling, you know, less than, let's say, seven feet. I'll see a piece of uh, sheet uh, suspended above the oil burner. I, I believe it. There's, um, that's what's sitting up here in the corner. It may have come off the ceiling. That's been there since at least 1979. I don't know where it came from, but that lines up with, uh, with your experience. Um, so I sent this, a chunk of this aerosol off for testing, a whopping 55% asbestos. I mean, it's, yeah, a lot. Um, and it crumbles very easily. Uh, from another neighbor, I got a piece of straight asbestos paper. Took the trophy at 65%. Um, in my training, I had never seen this, but this lady had a piece of this just draped across her ductwork. I don't know if it originally wrapped all of it. I don't know why it was there, but um, I didn't even know what it was. I had to ask Sean. <laughs> because I had never seen it before. Um, the one advantage to this stuff, there is no asbestos-free lookalike. When you find this stuff, it's a pretty good bet. I mean, you should still have it tested, um, but it's, uh, you know, the, the, vinyl, the vinyl asbestos floor tile tested, the pieces I sent tested at two to 4% asbestos. And it's not, unless the floor is crumbling to dust under you, that's not much. This stuff out in the air, 55 to 65% and dripping dust, much bigger hazard. Bob. Yeah. Sorry. Um, the big hazard on floor tiles was schools. 
because in the 60s and 70s, what went down the school uh, aisles every night? The floor polisher. So they were polishing the floors, basically stirring up and grinding the surface, and exposing new fibers every night. So that was the big um, impetus to get rid of asbestos floor tiles was schools, hospitals, and everybody else who used, you know, thought they were doing the right thing by cleaning the floors every night. Uh, and what we now tell people is encapsulate the floor. Right. Don't peel it up if it's in good shape, <laughs> yeah. just encapsulate it. Um, yeah, that's, you pretty much finished that paragraph for me. Um, now, wasn't it also, isn't it also true, though, that for the floor tiles, that it's the mastic that has almost a greater asbestos content than the tiles? Uh, it, I was not able to scrape any up and have it tested. I've heard that same thing. Um, I don't have any information on that, but I wouldn't be surprised. Um, attic insulation is another big one. Uh, vermiculite is a loose fill material, the tiny pieces of crusty stone. You saw the um, mining scene, open air mining in the first picture I had. Uh, they would wet and kiln the little flakes of stone and puff them up into nuggets, the rough size and appearance of a breakfast cereal. Or, and to me, it looks like the Captain Crunch from hell. Um, I did not get a sample of this to show. Uh, I was in a, one of Sean's clients' houses, um, peeking out between the floorboards and an unfinished second floor. This is modern vermiculite sold as... Um, for amending soil, gardeners can put it into heavy soil so that it drains, no asbestos. Um, but the, the flakes are a lot smaller. Um, and I, like I said, I didn't get piece, didn't, didn't get samples of this to test, um, but they would pour this stuff into gaps up in an attic. They'd pour it around framing and wiring and plumbing to level it out and often would roll traditional fiberglass or rock wool over the top of it. They would also pour it down inside balloon frame walls. Uh, you can pour from the attic all the way down to the foundation. Um, and even if it's covered up in the attic, you'll see it trickling into light fixtures or creeping out the bottoms of walls into the basement. One but, <clears throat> almost certain use of uh, vermiculite <clears throat> or uh, asbestos in general, was radiant ceilings because uh, they needed a fire-safe insulation in contact with it on the upper side. So almost always when you have a radiant ceiling <clears throat> from that era, you're going to have a layer of vermiculite on top of it. What do you mean radiant ceiling? For the heating, There's heating elements in the ceiling. Is this an old house thing? Oh, yeah. It? Okay. It, it, it's you see actually, more old houses than I do. Yeah, it, it's actually pretty prevalent in 50s. I, every time I've seen in an attic, these are not heated attics. Um, well, so the, att the attic isn't heated. <clears throat> it's literally the ceiling itself. Um, the tiles in the ceiling get warm. Okay. I, and it was supposed <laughs> to be the latest and greatest thing because you're, you, know, you were heating the part of you that sensed it. Uh, it's actually still popular in California because, <laughs> um, again, California doesn't need that much heat. Okay. So they'll pour this in. It ends up in the walls. And this is a neighbor's basement where it's continually raining into their basement. Um, when you look up at the underside of the floor... You'll see it coming through the subfloor. It'll, there's, there's always a cobweb to catch it, but that's what that is. Um, and I gave this guy a test kit. He's got children in the house. Um, so he's not sure exactly what he's got. Um, there are some great pictures on the Inspectopedia website. Um, for example, he's, that guy has tried to catalog all the colors and names of all the asbestos floor tile. He's also got a picture of vermiculite in an attic where it's poured out on the attic floor and the empty bags of zonalite are sitting right on top of it. Um, about as good a smoking gun as we'll ever catch. Um, 
But with the vermiculite, there's a lot of internet disinformation. Um, when I started reading and doing some research, I variously read online that only one shipment from Libby, Montana contained asbestos. And I also read that Zonalite and later WR Grace shipped as many as 150,000 tons of it a year. Uh, the latter number comes from the EPA. I'm gonna take their number. Um, they estimate that the one single mine in Libby, Montana, which has been a super, super fun site since 1999, may have produced as much, of, as, much as 80% of the world's supply of vermiculite. The stuff went everywhere. And not all of it was abated with the trust funds created by the lawsuits. Um, vermiculite deposits are common around the world. They're actually rarely tainted with asbestos. Um, EPA estimates the Libby deposit at about 10% asbestos. Um, Grace, WR Grace loved the benefits of it so much they would buy asbestos from other mines to add it to their products to make them better. Um, 19 years after the formation of OSHA, the Libby mine closed in 1990, capping a 66 year run of production, um, which wasn't all that long ago. Um, so you can, you can imagine the attic floor with um, vermiculite on it and the bags of WR Grace, empty WR Grace sitting on top. Um, <clears throat> it's a little bit like hearsay, because you can imagine a contractor trying to get rid of their old stock of asbestos laden vermiculite. You know, they can just put some empty bags on top and you're not, you don't know exactly what's on the floor there. All you see is an empty package. Um, again, test, test, test. Um, Transite is another one that's very fun. Um, it's an amazing asbestos bearing concrete product brought to us by the original danger deniers at John's Manville. Um, they buried the first stateside asbestos lawsuit back in 1934 and the plaintiff herself in 1954. Mesothelioma, mesothelioma wasn't even linked to asbestos until 1960. Um, but Manville's company policy into the 1970s included informing employees that asbestos fibers would simply dissolve in their lungs. And they specifically did not inform them if their annual company physical found any signs of asbestosis. You could live with it for decades without dying. Their executives laughed. Uh, this came up in their big court case. <clears throat> they literally wanted their employees to work, retire, and then die before drawing much unemployment, before drawing or retirement, rather. Um, they actually made more money that way. And in 1982, they set the record for the largest American bankruptcy with 65,000 claims still pending. Um, Transite is best known for the pipe brand, Corduct. Um, Range from residential furnace vents <clears throat> to underground HVAC to huge commercial sewer lines. Right up these. Um, so this was kind of fun. <laughs> this was uh, right in the yard at my, uh, the reuse place where I used to work. I walked in one day and was like, holy cow. Um, so they would, they would join these with, uh, they would cement little plastic hubs to join the pieces. I think there were three different diameters here. This is all type I. So there's at least eight different kinds of transite or of corduct. Transite um, is uh, sort of the, the brand name, like Kleenex or Romex. Corduct is the round duct that you see here. Um, New York City is still trying to replace all their transite electro electrical conduit under the bridges in the city. That's a lot of conduit. Um, <clears throat> they're still advertising for people to do the removal. Um, So other than Corduct, they also made corrugated roofing, sound dampening ceiling tiles, and get this, movable walls. Um, they, uh, we can't really call a asbestos cement 
dot translate. It's uh, that's the parent brand. It's not the name of that round duct. And every other building material supplier had their own brand of asbestos material duct. It was glass iron, chemtite, oconite, thermotile. <clears throat> you may never see that label, but you don't need to. Um, again, uh, this one, this pipe is heavy. I mean, it's hard. 55% asbestos. There's a lot of it in there. But sitting installed in a house, it's not going to shed much asbestos. Uh, I talked to Sean a little bit about the, um, the underground HVAC duct work. Well, there's some of the um, movable walls. Think partitions in a school, you know, or a, yeah, or rec room, whatever. You um, fly them back and forth to change your, your layout. Um, but yeah, you don't need to see the, the brand name. It's all suspect, but you'd have to get a test to know for sure. There's a second problem with transite is HVAC ducts. Uh, yeah. And we were, Sean was just mentioning, oh, he said, buoy. <clears throat> so there's an entire development that all of the HVAC, they're all on slab. All of the HVAC ducts are underneath the slab, which means they're in the dirt. There's no ceiling around that. So concrete, as we know, is porous. So the inside <laughs> of the ducts get wet. They, there's no hard, hardly not a way to get wet. And you get dust moisture and darkness, what do you get? Growth. Gold. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's actually after what I've been told by a couple of AI, IAQ guys is after 50 years, everything that's friable on the inside has fried, but we still have the organic growths that are still spitting out spores. Um, and you can't scrub it. Um, you might be able to line it with a couple of people who've shown up here with the epoxy lining but it would be god awful expensive. And you'd have you'd never be able to verify how well it was covered. And they will. I mean you can count mold spores coming out. And yeah. As long as they do that. <laughs> yeah, but it, it's most of the time the people I've talked to say you have to bend it in place and most of them say it should be filled with something so it can't be reused. Yeah. Yeah. So there's other ACMs, um, duct sealants, popcorn sealings, joint compound. I spoke at length with a state inspector with the Maryland Department of the Environment. He describes contractors back in the day being able to go to the, the hardware store and buy literal buckets of asbestos. They take it onto the job site and mix it with anything they wanted to lighten, fireproof, uh, or add texture to. Um, it's kind of the worst case scenario. It could be anywhere or everywhere in a home. Um, the, you know, if they leave a bucket behind, you don't, still don't know where it is. You still have to test every material. And, you know, that's kind of hard to do. Um, it, you almost need something like a blanket statement similar to the one about lead paint. Um, it's just a starting point for your client. Asbestos regulation remains a hod hodgepodge mess of EPA, Consumer Product Safety Commission, and state rules. The EPA's total ban on ACMs and asbestos floor tile dropped in 1989, was appealed and vacated in 1991, and was never fully reinstated. Uh, only a few products, like the asbestos paper, remain fully banned. Other new products can contain up to 1% asbestos or even more if there's a bituminous or resinous binding agent that holds the fibers in place. Um, you keep saying test, test, test. Um, I ran into something weird that as an inspector, I can't do the testing. I can't do the collection. Why not? <clears throat> um, I'm, not an, I'm not a licensed asbestos professional. There's a separate license in Maryland for asbestos. I asked them specifically about that. You can get an, an industrial hygienist can do it. They also have something called a uh, consultant for which there is no requirement or license. I mean, you think you're a handyman is going to rip your floor out, might take a sample in to get tested. That's literally on the MDE, MDE website and what the guy told me on the phone is there isn't a legal requirement. You may not want the liability at all. Right. Because um, <clears throat> I asked a, a couple of years ago, you know, can I carry baggies and, and stuff and, you know, get a little tiny bag uh, and send it off to EMSL? 
um, and was told no, but that might have changed. Okay. So I was just going to say the, I'm sorry, Sean. I was, I was just going to say, I, th I think you can, anybody can, like Matt's saying, the liability thing is real though. If you present yourself as an asbestos professional, you better be an asbestos professional or it'll come back on you. And I'll talk a bit more about the testing at the end. Um, Matt, we got a question from the online audience about um, some of these uh, materials that are they're using to seal ducts, you know, putting inside the, you know, lining the ducts with an air seal or something. Are you familiar with that? I'm not. Um, I mean, I have some show and tell, but this is by no means a, an exhaustive supply of all the <clears throat> asbestos materials out there. I don't, anyone else? Are you, is the person online thinking about uh, like fix my ducks where they do that um, epoxy uh, aeroseal? Aeroseal is the product. Yeah, they squirt through your duct system and any little tiny leaks, the little bubbles like pile up on the leak and then it stops the leak. Yeah, I was thinking more of the epoxy injection people who talk to us about uh, plumbing pipes. cast iron plumbing pipes. Yeah. They also yeah. do sewer pipes and actually larger. They could do this. I talked to them a couple of years ago and they said, you don't want to know what it costs per foot on a six or an eight inch pipe. I, so the last word on vermiculite is the, all those lawsuits and the regulation allowed all of the existing supplies to be used up. Um, so vermiculite that might've been included into a popcorn ceiling or textured ceiling could be legally sold well into the 1980s um, as contractors used them up. <clears throat> and the new materials, most companies keep their ingredients proprietary. And now that asbestos is such a boogeyman, they would not advertise it um, like you see on the tile. So it's basically, you have to test. Um, it's hard to know exactly what it is you're looking at. Um, the, uh, and a word about the, the buckets of asbestos, uh, textured ceiling might start out with asbestos filler but the installer is gonna use whatever's on hand. If he runs out of that, he's gonna try something else. So when you or the homeowner comes in to test the ceiling, you can't pick one little spot. You need a representative sampling of the entire surface to have a, a good chance of catching any asbestos there. Um, that may be best left to an industrial hygienist who's had some training in it, um, but this is all stuff that you, you know, clients ask and we're, we should be able to give them some guidance as you know as generic as that is um exterior of uh, asbestos siding asbestos uh shingles you know when solid fuel furnaces were more common and wood wood roofs were more common fire was a big deal this was a big improvement in safety sort of <clears throat> um and there's some more stuff from the maryland department of the environment here um the uh Stuff, these items can be removed, even nine inch tile can be legally removed by anybody so long as they are not damaged or cut. If it's only the um, factory edge, it's considered non friable and it can be removed. If, you, if the pile, tiles start breaking and shattering, all of a sudden it's friable and then you need the full abatement. And it's a pretty fine line uh, between there. Uh, roofing. Uh, is, the only, is only regulated when the materials, the, the plastic shingles, measure over 5,850 square feet. Most houses, you can just rip it right off. Uh, that's targeted mostly at schools, like Bob said, hospitals, churches, larger. <clears throat> there weren't that many super large houses back in the day. Um, and you can refer to the Maryland Department of the Environment website for an assessment of the different techniques to pop tiles off cleanly and not releasing uh, fiber into the air. Uh, they don't talk about it much. Um, it's kind of nerve wracking work taking on the liability. Um, so there's very little guidance on what's legal or even rational to do. And disposal is a, also a large problem. Some counties will accept non-friable waste from within their own borders, others won't. Um, if you've got a truckload of this stuff, you may have to drive it out of state and pay a lot of money to actually legally throw it away. Um, that blue house I showed you early on was a neighbor's house. 
And she swore up and down. It was sided with asbestos in the 60s. And then I took a couple pieces, and it's not asbestos. It's wollastonite, 65% wollastonite, some other mineral. Looks like asbestos, but she was terrified to do anything. Um, so again, you got to test it. Um, <clears throat> so how does testing actually work? Um, I got my fixer up for 10 years ago. My inspector, uh, Danny, inspected it. He's not here tonight. Um, I had vermiculite in the attic. I'm like, geez, what are you going to do with this? Because I needed to rip all the ceilings out and gut the place. Um, so I Googled it, and I found EMSL Labs. They had a, uh, an office right in Beltsville, and I think it was 130 bucks. I took a sample in, no asbestos. I was good to go. It was 13 hefty bags full of vermiculite that I threw out the attic window and donated to uh, Eco City Farms because <laughs> they have a lot of clay soil. Um, uh, EMSL, and there's a, you know, there's a whole host of, there's a list on the MDA website of all the labs that are certified to test for asbestos in the state. A lot of them also do radon, mold, Legionella. Um, you can make it part of your business, but now you know at least that they do it and how to get it done. Um, uh, they gave me a discount on the dozen or so tests I took in because it was just for this talk. It wasn't for a home. And they gave me a ton of the baggies. There's vermiculite test kits and regular other ones. Um, but all they require is double bag Ziplocs. And they need about a two inch by two inch piece or the equivalent of dust. And they'll, um, they'll test it. So they, um, but it looks, so they only see a tiny piece of what's in your house. If the material isn't homogenous, you could easily miss asbestos by taking just one sample. Um, and la uh, layered things like the air cell, they'll separate the different layers out, test them separately and charge you separately, but they need to be able to do that to find it. If it's only in one layer, they'll need to catch it there. Um, and this is, uh, uh, polarized light microscopy. They take a piece, they look for crystals that look like asbestos, and they'll estimate the quantity. Uh, there's a more sophisticated one, transmission electron micrography, um, more expensive. Um, it nails exactly that that crystal that they see is asbestos and not something that looks similar. Um, you would do that if you were going to go to court or if it's a very expensive project you're talking about. You may end up doing both. Um, but in Maryland, any homeowner can do this. Um, so can an industrial hygienist, who's probably taking the, the most accurate sample. Um, and I mentioned consultant, which is anybody who takes the sample into the lab and drops it off. In all cases, though, there's a chain of custody. That address is tied to that material. And in theory, everyone who ever lives there has a record of, of the asbestos in the building. Um, this may be far more liability than you want to take on, but the information is mainly for helping guide your client to the information they want. Seemingly a well-kept secret, except now you know how to test, test, test. Um, thank you. Oh yeah, the underground ducts, they're pretty strong. I forgot to give you some new pictures. Do we have any questions on asbestos? So one of I have uh, just one of the things that I've uh, told clients is if asbestos is improperly removed in a home that has forced air, it's possible that the fibers have now contaminated the entire house. Is it possible to decontaminate a house that's been exposed like that? Um, you'd have to be very thorough, but yeah, they, they will come in and take, I mean, like with the mold tests, they run a machine to take so many cubic feet of air and they'll look for how many fibers collect on a sample. Like my house, my current house had um, air cell insulation and they had abated it at some point before I moved in. I found all the paperwork in a closet and they paid for 
the post-removal testing to show that there's zero fibers in the air. If you're in Europe, in this situation, and especially in one you described, they're going to need to take dust samples from throughout the house and whatever, pop some registers and get them out of the ductwork, maybe out of the furnace cabinet. You'd want to check everywhere that air flows to make sure there's none in the dust. Um, it'd be very hard to clean all that. I've heard the same thing on the lead dust people. And they said on modern houses, it's easy to do or more modern houses. But the further back we go, especially if we get to hardwood floors, because all of the dust collects in the cracks between the floors under the um, baseboards and things like that. He said, that's where the most of the lead tests fail is somebody goes in and swabs between the floorboards or under the baseboard Yeah, and they fail. So I, I suspect somebody who's contaminated a house would have the same issue. Any other questions?